All right. Okay. Today I'd like to talk about kind of a macro approach to sociology, and it's, it's an incredible amount of ideas to cover in a short amount of time, but it's a powerful idea to understand where we're heading into the future. What I've got up here is a uh, chart that has four different types of societies plus whatever society we're currently creating into the future. And then it has different things about that society, whether they had a surplus, war, what type of religion, whether they had ceremonial cannibalism and ritual sacrifice or not, those kinds of little juicy morsels that are kind of fun. Uh, and this comes from a husband and wife anthropo a sociologi sociological team named Linsky, L-E-N-S-K-I, and the male's name is Gerhard Linsky, and the woman's name is Jean Linsky. She's actually a poet, he's a sociologist, and they work together. What he argues is that the type of society, the way we make our living, whether we're hunters and gatherers or working in factories in the industrial society, determines a great deal about how we behave day to day, what our families are like and so forth. So let's kind of go through this. Hunting and gathering societies have been around since the beginning of time, and you can put that at 100,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago for Homo sapiens sapiens, or you could put it at three to five million years ago for creatures that are incredibly similar to us. We've been around from the beginning of time, and to about 9,000 BC, as uh, uh, 7,000 BC, sorry, or 9,000 years ago, as the dominant type of society that existed on planet Earth. Now, hunters and gatherers still exist on planet Earth, but they're rapidly disappearing. When they made their living, they hunted for a living and they gathered for a living, and that specifically determined a great deal. Did they have a surplus? Well, not really. And if they had a surplus, they couldn't have much to do with it because they didn't have a way to store it or carry it around or anything like that. So they basically are eating what they have available, which means that they've got to move around. So I'm going to put mobility here. And they were highly mobile people. They followed the herds, they followed the crops, things of that nature. Now, their status was relatively equal because status is determined to a large extent by what you own. And so if everybody's owning about the same amount of stuff, status isn't much different. There's not a surplus, there's the, the status is relatively equal. The family type is uh, extended, meaning mom, dad, uncles, aunts, by over how they define those different groups, uh, but relatively small because they simply couldn't feed very many people. These typical bands are about 40 people big sometimes a little bigger, and sometimes there's so, such little food they have to split that band for part of the year. Male-female, relatively equal. Now this does not mean they were the same because in fact females dominated certain roles such as the gathering, and men dominated other roles such as the hunting. Uh, males and females had specific separate ceremonies, so they weren't considered exactly the same by any means, but in terms of political impact on the society, most of these societies, women were far more equal to men than they ever would be again until more current times. War, well, there's no surplus, nothing to steal, so no, they didn't have war. Did they have conflict? Yeah. We've dug up bodies of hunters and gatherers who've killed each other, you can tell by the projectile points stuck in their bones. Politics, again, relatively equal. You didn't have any great status. You had headman, you had shaman. But all the status differences and political differences were based upon the charisma or the personality of the individual, not upon acquired wealth or massive class differences that later occurred. So the politics were relatively equal as well. Education was on-the-job training, so it was integrated right into the society. Your dad and your mom taught you what you had to know. Your uncles taught you what you had to know. The religion was a religion of animism, typically. And that's a religion in which they worship nature, they worship the spirit world, they feel that everything's alive, rocks, trees, and you go back to the ancient Druids, for example, who worship nature and worship trees. These were more than trees to them, they were part of the spirit of the universe. No concept of one great monotheistic god occurs in hunting and gathering societies, typically. And did they have uh, cannibalism for religious purposes? In other words, eating people or killing, ritually sacrificing, your, your best virgin or your best warrior or your best young mind or something like that. No evidence of that. 
that doesn't occur until later. So we go along for thousands of years, and then all of a sudden, somewhere around 7,000 BC to 3,000 BC, somebody figures out how to plant and domesticate animals. Now, they don't have the plow, they're not terribly productive, they're still partially dependent upon hunting and gathering in the early stages of the society. But that one simple notion that somebody, probably a woman, figured out, because they were in charge of, uh, of gathering anyway. Uh, I drop these seeds here. You know, last spring I come back and my God, look what's grown. It finally dawns on people after being around for a couple million years. Whoa, we could do this. <laughs> we could plant crops. We could raise goats. That simple little change creates some surplus. And the fact that you've got some surplus means that the statuses remain fairly equal, but some people have higher status. Have higher status. And what's that status based upon? It's based upon owning more goats, or it's based upon being more successful with the crops, or something of that nature. But still, it's very tribal based. It's not individualistic based. Family type was extended, mom, dad, the kids, and relatives, because they're helping each other, and a little bit larger than before. Why? Because you've got a surplus. You've got more food to feed people. What happens to their mobility? They're still following the animals and the crops that nature provides, but since they're planting and since they're domesticating animals, they're less mobile than before. Not moving around quite as much. Male-female roles early on are relatively equal. By the time you get to advanced horticultural societies like uh, Jericho in the Bible, you've heard of the walls of Jericho, that was an advanced horticultural civilization, you start to change those roles. Women begin to lose some status. Not much at first, not nearly as much as they would lose later. And they seem to lose status based upon lack of control of the surplus. And that may be sheerly due to physical strength. Do they have war? Yes, but limited. Now they've got a surplus, there's reasons to raid your neighbor, there's reasons your neighbor's going to raid you. And so they start getting some war, but uh, we've got videos of horticulture societies having wars and they've got rules. A lot of them don't fight after dark. <laughs> they don't have nuclear weapons, so they're not going to kill off the whole society. You know, they've got wooden spears and stone ends and metal ends and things like that. And, and uh, it's just simply not going to get many people killed, but there is some warfare that's developed. Politics starts to develop more of a pyramid shape. Still a fairly low, flattened pyramid early on, but the further you get into the society. And what that means is that you get some people in charge. And they tend to be religious, political leaders who are controlling what? The surplus. They're controlling the surplus. Education is still OJT, on the job training. Religion starts getting into polytheism. Gods start becoming more personified. There are usually multiple gods, if you go back to the Greek temples and things of that nature. Uh, you're talking about a belief in a bunch of different gods that are kind of competing. They're kind of like us. They, they, they look like us, only they're gods. You know, they're on, on someplace else besides, uh, besides the earth. And notice that kind of reflects the increasing distance between the people with no power and the people with power. You start getting more personified gods at that time. They invent ceremonial cannibalism. They invent ritual sacrifice. And what they're doing is either trying to eat their cultural hero, or like the best virgin or the best warrior, or they're trying to get the spirit and the qualities of the brain or whatever, the courage of the warrior that they captured from the neighboring tribe and killed. And some of these rituals are just unbelievable. So they, they do have, all of a sudden, ritual sacrifice and ceremonial cannibalism. And they actually invent slavery at this point, too, by the way. So something very interesting, technological innovation increased lots of things for the positive for many of these societies, but it actually resulted in the invention of war, the invention of slavery, the invention of ceremonial cannibalism, and the invention of ritual sacrifice. So technological innovation that we're seeing today doesn't always mean good moral improvement. All right, then about 3000 BC, and think uh, the pyramids here, think Egypt, to about 1750, 
AD, so it's a long-lasting society. It's a society you've read about in most history books. It's a society most history courses are about. And it's an agrarian society, and the big thing they come up with is the plow. Sounds like a simple invention to you and me, but it's only a little over a hundred and some years ago that central Illinois, that they actually got a plow, a steel plow that could break this sod, and my God, did they uncover incredibly rich soil. What's the plow do? It buries organic material, buries the weeds. It pulls dirt down to 18 inches or 21 inches. It's got nutrients that have soaked down back to the top. Uh, and it makes you more productive. And if you're more productive, you can stay in one place much longer. So you're very stable. You're not mobile. You're not moving around a lot. You may be in generation after generation after generation in the same exact village. Do they have a surplus? generally plenty of surplus. And when you start getting plenty of surplus, you gotta have somebody who keeps track of it, so they invent writing. They invent symbols some way, and that's connected to the church. So it's political, religious leadership controlling the surplus. Uh, the status becomes very unequal. Uh, the invention of slavery occurred back in horticulture society and really takes a leap forward in in uh, much more serious degrees here in the agrarian society. You've got a few people that are nobles, that are landed aristocracy, and they often are telling the, uh, the rest of the people that either they're God or they're descendants of God. You know, think of the pharaohs. They were gods on earth, they said. Think of the emperor of Japan, just died not too long ago, Hirohito. He claimed to be a direct descendant of the sun god. This is an agrarian idea and very unequal in status. Family type was extended, mom, dad, the kids, uncles, grandparents, etc., and often got very large because you had the surplus to feed them and you needed the workers in the fields. Notice they're very stable and not moving very much here. Male-female roles became extraordinarily unequal during the agrarian era. Not only were there millions of male serfs and slaves, Tsar Nicholas I laid uh, ownership to several million Russian peasants as serfs that were literally owned by him, but that men were con considered not only owned by the king and so forth, but the women were owned by their husbands. Um, and if you remember some of the, the movies like Rob Roy and what's the Mel Gibson movie? Um, can't think of the name of it. Uh, it shows a wonderful example of what we call the ride of the first night. And that's where the husband and wife didn't even have the right to have sex with each other when they got married. The nobility made that choice. So the nobility could literally have, not only have sex with your wife, but impregnate her as well. And your son might be uh, of nobility. So male and female roles became extremely unequal. Women were considered virtually worthless in European society, particularly in England and some of those societies at that point. No rights, just about anything could be done. War. War became extremely common. Why? Because of the surplus. Constantly trying to take over somebody else, or they're trying to take you over, you're trying to protect them. So when you go to a history course, and we've got some great ones at this college, you're going to hear a great deal about one war after the other, because what they're studying is not human society in general. They're studying the agrarian era and the early industrial era. Politics, extremely unequal, so you get this pyramid in which you've got this landed aristocracy, a few people at the top controlling everybody else. Very unequal. Education was OJT for the average person, but universities were invented. And in fact, there's an argument that the reason that different uh, departments can't get along with each other at universities is they were set up that way. Um, Buckminster Fuller, who's now deceased, but was a fancy professor down at SIU Carbondale invented the geodesic dome. He wrote a little book on it and he said that what really happened was the king wanted to be in charge of all knowledge. And so he set up universities so he had his mathematician that he didn't allow to talk to the astrologer, that he didn't allow to talk to the agrarian guy, because he knew knowledge was power. And if he kept them arguing amongst themselves and not able to talk and share knowledge equally, then he controlled the knowledge. And he says the modern university system is partially dysfunctional because of that. <laughs> Everybody thinks they've got the right answer. We've got too big egos to talk to the other people we can learn from. Religion by this time becomes very monotheistic. And it's very much tied to the state. 
And so the king and the pope are kind of parallel powerful figures. And notice the monotheistic concept of God develops most clearly under a society in which you've got a monopolitics, in which you've got a king, in which you've got a pharaoh. And so the version of religion seems to reflect people's understanding of their own society and then projecting it onto the heavens, trying to understand the non-understandable. Did they have cannibalism and ritual sacrifice? Some, but they generally abolished it. But they kept it up symbolically. And what do I mean by that? Well, Christianity is a perfect example of where they eat their cultural hero on a regular basis. And I don't mean this in any disrespectful manner. If you go to church and you eat the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, uh, in the Catholic religion you are literally taught that that uh, trans uh, mutates into the, the literal body of Christ and the literal blood of Christ. In the Protestant religions you're just taught it's symbolic of it. But what to me this is not sacrilegious to talk about, but what it shows is that Christianity is powerfully bonded with our huge past, all the way back to horticulture societies where we're eating our cultural hero. I know that's mind-boggling to think about. Then sometime about 1750 AD, what happened in Europe? And it lasted until about 1950 AD, and that's uh, the Industrial Revolution. Um, it happened about 1850 in the United States, 1750 in Europe. And the Industrial Revolution, suddenly no longer we depended primarily upon agrarian society, although we obviously have to have food produced. Uh, and the farmers got so efficient that we're down to 1 to 2 percent of Americans are farmers that feed the rest of us. The industrial society invents the factory system, replaceable parts, and you move to where the jobs are, so let's go down to mobility, and guess what? We go from being incredibly stable to incredibly mobile one more time in the history of mankind. We're moving around for what reason? The same reason we moved around back as hunters and gatherers. We're moving to Decatur because the factories are hiring. We're leaving Decatur because the factories are lay, lay, laying off. And we leave our extended family behind, so the family type becomes nuclear and small. And that becomes very susceptible to divorce, of course. It's very difficult when all the pressure's on two people and a couple of children to keep things together and excitement and interest. And, but oddly enough, even though we have a 50% divorce rate, in the agrarian era, 50% of the families were also broken. Not by divorce, but by death of one of the spouses. All right, do we have a surplus? Unbelievable surplus. When I traveled through China, I found out not only did they not have garages to have garage sales, uh, they didn't have any garages, they didn't have lots of surplus to be selling. <laughs> and they didn't have this mass turnover stuff that we, we certainly do. The status uh, is odd because you clearly get an elite group that becomes extraordinarily powerful. It probably runs a society, even behind the scenes. Uh, unbelievable concentrations of wealth in the hands of a few. But the average person has more status than they've had in the previous society. So I don't want to be naive, but move to equality for men and women, move to equality for average people. So if we go down here to male, female, again, more equal. The concept that you and I have the right to vote even in local elections is a mind-boggling concept. The concept that we have uh, the right to freedom of speech and criticize our government shows us that we're more equal than we were back in agrarian societies. War, yeah, not only do we have war continued, but it's more serious. It's less frequent, but because of the nature of nuclear warfare and all kinds of tactical uh, battlefield weapons, it's much more devastating. Oddly enough, war is less common in industrial society, regardless of what we're going through right now, but it's more dangerous. Politics, again, more equal. The concept of democracy, the people should have a vote. Uh, behind the scenes, there's a lot of inequality. You've got the power elite, that's, that's a political, military, industrial complex of people making lots of decisions. If you look at the Iraqi war, clearly the people who got the contracts, Halliburton had all kinds of contacts in the military and politics. That's how they got that, those big contracts. But the reality is you and I are more equal than we were in the agrarian society. Education again becomes more equal. 
because the society says we need people to be equal. We invented community colleges because we realized we had lots of bright, talented people out there we weren't tapping the resources of because we didn't, they didn't fit the traditional university. Uh, so the education becomes more equal. Uh, religion is still there. I don't know exactly what to put. It's very monotheistic. Uh, lots of splits in religion, lots of disagreements, but it's still an incredibly powerful force in every society, and it's existed in every single society we've ever found. Uh, again, we don't have uh, ritual sacrifice or ceremonial cannibalism except symbolically. Now, notice some trends here. We've gone from, in the hunting and gathering society, being highly mobile to being highly stable by the time we're farmers to being highly mobile again. Families have changed from extended to nuclear. Religion has changed from animism to polytheism to monotheism to all kinds of splits. Well, what you and I are living in started about 1950, and we can call that the future society. We can call it the information age. Because we no longer are making our living primarily by growing crops or factories. In fact, we've lost one factory job after another, particularly in America. What are we making our money on? So far, information transfer. And we're already beginning to lose those jobs. We're having programming that's going on for the United States in Springfield, Illinois, that's being farmed out over the internet to the um, uh, middle of India. Absolutely astounding what's happening. So we don't know. These are all big question marks. If you're confused about your life, Welcome to the club. <laughs> if you're confused about where a society is, God, you're right along with a whole bunch of us. We are like a woman giving birth to a baby. We know there's a new society being born. We just don't know what direction it's heading. And we don't even understand the impact we're having on forming that society. And that's what we're trying to study. Thank you.